Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Thank you for joining. Um, so today I'm going to talk about something that's coming to Unity. I said a revolution is coming because it's the stuff that is coming is really revolutionary. It will take some time to come, but um, it will be really cool. Uh, my name is uh, Ciro Continisio, uh, and I work as a technical evangelist at Unity from uh, Brighton in the UK. So. Uh, you might have seen some presentations by uh, Unity's uh, CTO, Joachim uh, Ante. Do you know the guy? Uh, he was talking about this thing, performance by default, he says. Uh, and um, that's a big claim, uh, but that's the driving principle of something that he's working on and that is bringing this revolution to Unity. So this claim is, um, I think, is twofold. He has two parts. The first thing is performance, and that means that we, uh, at Unity, we want to allow people to write performant code um, in Unity, of course. Uh, so we want to uh, bring your Unity applications and games to the next level. We want to enable like AAA games. How are we going to do this? I'm going to show you how in a second. So just take this as a, as, a, as a thing for now. And then the second thing, the second part of this claim is by default. And that's, for me, probably the most important part. It's like we don't want you to... Um, make a lot of work to get this performance. We want the performance to be there by default. So whatever you do, the code is performing better than before. You don't need to uh, do complex engineering to get to squeeze that performance out of Unity if you want to make a AAA game in the future. You might have seen this demo. Uh, it was a demo that was shown at Uni Austin uh, last year in Texas. Uh, and it's a demo that was built in roughly like one month or uh, a little bit more uh, by Unity and by this studio that is in Serbia called Nordius. So Nordius is making this game called Spell Souls, so Spellbound, I remember. Uh, and um, they reused the assets uh, for this demo that was shown. And I'm going to, you know, maybe you've seen, who has seen this demo on stage? Nobody, okay. So maybe you've seen it, maybe not, but uh, the idea is that... <coughs> I'm going to show you that even on this computer, which is not a game laptop, right? Because whenever we show these demos, people will, will think like, okay, that's probably a beast of a machine. They're running it on a, on a computer that's uh, crazy powerful. So I'm going to show you how this demo runs on my, on my laptop. It's, you know, it's running. It's not the best. Like the, the frame rate, of course, is not the same as in, uh, on the one seen in Austin. But you can see that basically here there's like, 7,000 units, and many more are getting spawned here from these portals. And they're like, it's really hard to control, actually. So they're all, uh, they're all 3D meshes, they're all animated. Uh, they have like uh, pathfinding, you know, grouping. And then when they come together here on the, on, the, on the bridges, they fight between them. They kill each other and stuff like that. So this is just to show you how how much stuff can you handle in Unity if you, if you harness all these systems that I'm going to talk about today. And, you know, this is, again, like this is running on this machine, which is definitely not like a powerful machine. It doesn't have a graphic card. And, in fact, the problem why I'm getting, like, uh, lower than optimal frame rate is not because of the CPU, but it's because of the GPU. So I'm rendering too many triangles at this point. Uh, again, this demo was made for, like, a different a different target, you know, like a, like a gaming laptop. So, how are we going to get this performance? And we think getting this performance has different aspects, has, this has different problems that we need to deal with, and that today is hard to deal with in Unity. So the first thing is the harnessing the power of all the cores in a CPU. So CPUs, if you look at the performance of CPUs uh, in time, uh, the performance of a single thread is basically plateauing. So it's, it's getting to a limit, and it's not going to go any further. Um, so we can't make CPUs that run faster on one thread. But on the other hand, the number of cores in a CPU is going up, and it's going to go up. It's going to grow. Any, uh, it's going to still grow. So the key here is, um, is leveraging all of these CPUs together, or oh, sorry, all, all of these cores together. And this is, if you worked in Unity, who is working here in Unity already? Okay, so have you ever done uh, multi-threaded code? One of you, okay. Is it hard? Yes, okay. 
So that's the, the thing, right? Uh, Multi-threaded code today in Unity is possible, but it's hard to do because Unity is not ready for that. And to be fair, I think it's hard to do anywhere, like in any engine and in any technology. Uh, an expert programmer can do multi-threading, but it's hard to maintain that code. If you want to refactor the code, it's hard. So we want to solve that problem too. We want to give you multi-threaded code in your hands, the possibility to make it, to make it quickly and safely, so that if you need to change the code later on in the process, or somebody else has to change your code, then it's easy. So we want to solve that problem. Another problem is the data layout. So today, this is how it looks like on the left. Unity uses game objects, and game objects are complex beasts. They have many parts. They have many components. So the game object uh, is made up of a transform and a mono behavior, which is your logic, uh, and an audio source, and, and so forth. And each one of these pieces contains both data and logic. Right? Every component has some functions that you can use. And these uh, components lie in, um, in memory in different parts of the memory. And then when Unity uses uh, this, uh, when Unity needs to uh, operate on these game objects, it has to go and fetch like all these pieces. And then if the game object references another game object, then it has to go there and fetch that other piece. And this slows down the execution a lot because you get uh, like a lot of uh, cache misses and Unity has to go back and fetch the data, operate on it, bring it back, fetch again, write on disk and so forth. So there's a lot of back and forth that we want to we wanna optimize. And for this, we're bringing in this new thing called the Entity Component System, which is basically transforming how Unity works from the game object to this new thing called the Entities. And the Entities are like super small containers of data. So they are like the new game object, if you want, but they contain no logic. So you have these Entities, which are very small, and they only contain data. And then you have the systems which operate on the entities. And the, the nice thing that the entity component system brings is that the data is going to be laid out in memory in a, in a very ordered way, in a, in a linear way, if you want. So if you have a lot of entities that have this component uh, that is the position, for instance, then all the positions will be in memory uh, contiguous to each other. So when the system operates on those entities, it finds like all the position components and it can write at super fast speed. And the same for um, that speed boxes, they're also a component. So you can have like an entity that has position and speed or you know, position, rotation, speed. You can bring in as many components as you want, like you did before, but they will be only data. And then the logic is somewhere else. So this is to solve that problem of data layout. Another problem that we have today is instantiation. Instantiation in Unity is costly. You create a new game object, and you will see like a little spike in the CPU usage. Uh, so if you're creating a thousand game objects, you will see a big spike, and you don't want that. And that's why people today, they use pools, object pools. If you're a smart developer, you will use object pools a lot. So inst you instantiate all the game objects at the beginning, and then you save them for later. But object pools bring new problems. First, you need to create them, and that requires uh, some work. So we want to solve that problem too. So we made a test, and with this new entity component system, uh, spawning 100,000 entities, which is a lot. Like you, you generally don't need this much entities, right? So 100,000 entities with five components, five of these new type of components, which take like 320 bytes in memory. Um, we made a test, and we wanted to see how fast you can spawn these entities. So the baseline that we are comparing against is the mem copy, which is like just copying memory from here to there. So just copying that, that bunch of memory for 100,000 entities to another location takes 8 milliseconds. Again, 100,000 is a lot. With game objects, if you were to spawn those game objects, it will take 7 full seconds to spawn 100,000 game objects with 5 components. And that's unacceptable, right? You, you wouldn't do that on, a, on one frame. Because one frame can't take seven seconds. So the, as I said, the baseline that we're comparing against is the memcopy operation to see like, okay, this is the fastest we can move memory around. How fast can the entity component system be? And the entity component system today takes nine milliseconds. So to, to allocate 100,000 entities with five components in memory, for the entity component system, it takes nine milliseconds, which is just one millisecond more than just copying that data around. And that's you know, the baseline that Unity wants to compare against and, and, 
and create this system for. We want to be able to take this performance and maintain it in time as we create this system, the entity component system. Um, and then another piece of the puzzle, uh, so we have the multi-core, multi-threaded code, we have the entity component system, and then the third piece of the puzzle uh, is this thing that we call Burst, and is a new compiler. And it's a compiler that basically is math aware. So is, it knows what you're trying to do with the math library, and it compiles it in a very optimal way. Um, and with this compiler, like automatically, if you use the math library that we're creating, uh, you just get uh, a speed boost uh, between 5 and 20 times uh, of the on these math operations. So this is not about the, f the quickness of like compilation, but once Boost has compiled the code, then when the code is executed, it runs like from time 5 to 20 times faster uh, when you're doing uh, math operations, because it knows uh, about these operations and it will compile them in an optimal way on each different platform. So it takes, you know, the full power, <coughs> sorry, it takes, um, um, it uses the platform optimally <coughs> because it compiles platform by platform. <coughs> I'm going to talk about these three things later. <coughs> so going into more detail, right? So those were the problems. We're going to solve them with these three systems. One is the C-sharp job system, um, which is being launched in 2018.1. And it's the thing that powers like all this multi-threaded code. So it's a system, it's a framework that allows you to create uh, multi-threaded code in Unity in a simple way. <coughs> um, it has no runtime allocations, <coughs> so you don't get any you know, spike in because of allocations. Everything is allocated at the beginning. And <coughs> the other uh, very important thing is it, uh, that it avoids race conditions for you. So if you are creating a job, and you want to run this job on different threads, and then you know the job is referencing the same set of data because you're operating on like a super long array of entities. Uh, then Unity makes sure that two threads are not writing to the same data at the same time, so you don't get any surprise, which is you know arguably the most uh, the hardest thing to do when you're writing multi-threaded code that you might end up writing from two threads on on the same data, and then problems happen, and then you know the editor will crash completely, your computer will crash. So uh, Unity checks that, and as you execute the code in the editor, it just gives you warnings, and it says, look, you're doing this, so fix that. Um, and that makes not only writing the code easy, but refactoring the code. And as I said before, if somebody joins your company later on, or you know, joins the team later on, and they need to touch code that somebody has written like months ago, then it's easy to do that. And they don't need to call like the person that originally wrote the code. So you get like more uh, uh, independent people on the team. Um, it also checks if you so you have control over the memory. You can allocate this memory, and you need to deallocate it. So if you don't, it also gives you a warning. So you don't get these like memory leaks, right? So it protects you against memory leaks in time, which is also a good thing. And then it's made to work with the burst, burst compiler. So if you use this new uh, mathematics uh, library when the job system runs super fast. So I'm going to show you a very quick demo of the job system. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a very stupid demo. It's, it's very simple just because I want to show you the code, so I need to keep it simple, otherwise we don't have time. Um, it's just basically instantiating like little spheres. Uh, if, uh, if you see if I select, these are just spheres moving around. Okay, uh, and it's spawning a lot of them. So in this case, I'm spawning like 2,200 spheres, and it's moving them around. So this is the traditional way of doing things. You have um, a mono behavior, then on the update, moves things around. Right? It just trans uh, operates. Can you see the code? No. Uh, so let's do this. It just operates on the um, on the transform and it just rotates this sphere around, right? So it, traditionally, there's two ways to do this. You either can do it this way, which is the noob way, and put the, the behavior on each sphere, and that's uh, super costly because Unity is going to call the update per object. Or you can create a system that moves them around on its own, um, so the system does the logic, but, um, but you're still not using all the threads. So with the job system, the thing you can do, so for example here, if I run this thing and I 
press space, then you see the FPS counter. If I go and spawn like 8,000 spheres, I hit like 30 FPS, and that's my limit. So here I have like all spheres that are moving themselves on their own. Uh, with the job system, it's kind of doing the same thing, but the movement is uh, jobified, we say. Uh, so here we can I can reach like different numbers. If I start adding spheres, Anyway, I'm not going to exaggerate, but like you can easily reach like 12,000 and still be like on 30 FPS. Um, so what's the key here? There's a, there's a, I'm going to show you the code again. Um, just very quickly, just to show you how the job, how simple the job system can be. So this is the job. This is the job that moves the spheres. As you can see, it's a struct. It's not a class. So no allocations. The uh, it inherits, well, it implements an interface that is called iJob Parallel for Transform. So this job is already made to work on transform components. And we provide all these interfaces. So you have a bunch of interfaces already made for you, then you can make your own, right? And then the job has an execute function, which is kind of like the update. So every thread is going to use this execute function on all of those game objects, or on those spheres, um, which works on the transform. And it's just going to do a bunch of operation. Now, this, this is a bit complex because this is an old version of the code. So uh, many things were not available in jobs. They are now. But this code is more complex than it should be. But it's basically just rotating the sphere around this uh, center point. Um, and this is the job, right? So this is the execute function. And then it has a bunch of... Um, uh, common parameters, like the speed at which the spheres will move, or it has the delta time, because the job is running on the C++ side of, of things, so it has no concept of Unity stuff. So the delta time or the time, the job doesn't know. So you need to pass this value to the job system once, and then the job will run on all the entities using that data. So in this case, we want to pass the delta time because we want to be frame rate independent. And then how do you use this job? So you use it this way. Um, you basically have a mono behavior like usual. So this is the system that operates on all the spheres, uh, which has a reference to all the transforms. And then it has a reference to the job. So what you want to do normally is in the, I need to scroll. Um, you basically just create the job and you pass all these parameters, right? So you, you give the job the data that you need uh, one time, delta time, uh, the position of the center pivot, the speed of rotation, the speed of movement, and then you schedule it, and you're done. So you schedule the job on those transforms. So first you create the job, and then you say, I want to schedule this job on this specific set of data. So run this job on all of those transforms. And then Unity just does it for you. And that's as easy as it, as it looks. Um, and then you, give, you get a handle back. So you can stop the job, or you can schedule jobs like one after the other in, uh, you know, in sequence and stuff like that. And Unity handles all of that uh, uh, scheduling for you. OK? So this is like a very simple example of how you do multi-threading uh, in Unity in the future. And again, this is a very simple job. It doesn't do much, but you get the idea. So again, simple way of creating a multi-threaded um, coding Unity. The other piece is the entity component system. Now, what's the problem with the demo that I just showed you? I'm doing something kind of, not dumb, but like, um, I'm still working on game objects. So that job is still, uh, you know, accessing transforms, like normal transforms. They are game objects, they have a transform, they have a sp uh, mesh renderer, mesh filter. So they come with a lot of data. And I spawned 12,000 of them. And then the job has to go and find that transform and change it every single frame, 12,000. And so jobs are great. They're a uh, first step. But uh, there's something else that we need to to uh, address, uh, to enable like this next level of performance. And I said before, data layout, right? So we need to um, 
kind of like uh, change this uh, pattern that we have with the game objects where there's a lot of data and logic and data are coupled. We need th this new way of, uh, we need a better way of laying out data. So the entity component system does that. So the entity component system, you could kind of see it as the future of game objects. Um, but I want to put a disclaimer here because the thing is entities and game objects are going to coexist for a while. So game objects are not going to disappear tomorrow or in 2018.1. They're going to still be there and you will still be able to use them if you want. So if you have something that doesn't need to be parallelized, you just have one entity, right? You just have one uh, instance of something like a light or a camera. You don't want to, I mean, today you can also not use the entity component system because it's not going to give you a lot of uh, advantage. So you can still use game objects the old way, if you want, the classic way, um, for a while. And that's, I think it, that's also a big advantage because then you can choose if you want the performance, the extreme performance, uh, or you want to just stay, you know, on the old way. And I think uh, game objects and just, you know, throwing like a mono behavior on a game object is also a very great way to prototype because it's, it's flexible. You can just like remove the uh, behavior and put another one or put it on another object. So it's really fa uh, fast for prototyping. So I think there's still a, w uh, a reason to stick to game objects and the old way of doing things, right? So they, they're going to stay for a while. But the entity component system, if you want to really squeeze performance, is, is the future. Uh, and the entity component system, it actually has, it still preserves this concept of components. So as you spawn these like 100,000 entities, they still have the li these little pieces of data and we still call them components because they are components and you can actually attach them and remove them uh, in a similar way. But today the problem is that you can do that only in code. You can't do it in uh, the, the editor. Um, but instead of being object-oriented, it's data-oriented programming, okay? So it, it kind of merges the component-based approach with data-oriented programming, which is what unlocks this next level of performance. So yeah, it, it enables this new optimized and flexible data layout, and it leans on the job system to process all that data. So the, if you're using entity component system, you're probably using the job system, right? Because you have so many entities that you really want to take advantage of all the cores to process those entities. Otherwise, if you're, if you're queuing all those entities on one single thread, then you're back to the start. Like you have so too many entities for one thread and then your frames are too long and your frame rate uh, decreases, right? Um, and finally, this is, uh, I don't know if I'm, I actually have time to talk about this. I shouldn't, but uh, there's two ways of using e ECS. So there's pure ECS, uh, which means like doing everything in code. So you just open a file and you just say, spawn me these many entities and put these components on these entities and you do everything in the code. And we call it pure ECS uh, because it's kind of the pure way of doing it. But... Um, we also know that uh, today people enjoy Unity because of the editor. They like to do things in the editor and we want to preserve that. We don't want to like give all the controls only on the programmer side. We need something in the editor that al allows you to create entities in the editor to inspect them because you want to see how an, an entity looks like before you run the game. And you also need to make like prefabs out of entities you know, and, and use like all the workflow that Unity has in the editor uh, because, of course, you want some of this work to be done by designers, by artists. So you can't do everything in code. So we have these two things now. Pure ECS, which is all in code. And then we have this thing that we call hybrid. And hybrid is done in the editor by having a game object and putting a component on it. And the component makes the game object visible to the entity component system. So the entity component system takes the game object and like, kind of like strips the data and rebuilds entities out of it. And that's why it's hybrid, because it merges, like it bridges these two words. So I'm going to show you another demo, again, like very simple, which is here. And this is a demo that I made. Uh, so, well, just to show you how, what it does, it's a very stupid demo. Again, it's just spawning, uh, I think, 3,000 of these ships, um, just moving them around. 
the thing that actually caps this demo, silly decision by me, is the poly count. Like these ships are ma made to be uh, the player, so they have too many polygons. So here I'm, I'm bound again by GPU. Like I'm drawing, I think, uh, yeah, 12 uh, million triangles, which is a bit too much for my computer. So I can't spawn more ships because, because of polygons. But the CPU is running like very fast. Um, so one thing you will notice here is they are not game objects. You see? There's no game objects here on the hierarchy. And that's a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because, as I said, uh, they're, they're lighter. There's less data that Unity is handling. There's less like reads that it has to do. Everything is living on the C++ side and it's super fast. The problem is that I can't really inspect them. I can't select them in the scene, you know. <coughs> so this is, um, this is something that we want to address in time, and that's why the ECS is not production ready now. The job system is, like you can use the job system in your project. I would advise to use the job system today in the your projects. I wouldn't say start a project now and use the ECS. Like you can experiment on it, but you don't want to start production now. Because that's something we want to solve. We want to really bridge like these two words and make sure that an artist can create an entity here and then make a prefab out of it and then spawn like a hundred thousand of these. So the way you would inspect entities today is this uh, new window which is called the entity debugger. If I press play, <coughs> here I see my systems. Do you remember I said entities are only data and then the logic is in the systems. So the data is lay out laid out linearly and then the system goes in and just does the, the pass and like reads all the data and operates on the data. So these are the systems that are currently running in the editor. And uh, for each of them, I can actually, this zooming feature is, is worse, it's really bad. Uh, I can actually select them and then I can see that this system is working on these components. Uh, for instance, the transform system that's operating on position, heading, and transform matrix, three components that these entities have, is currently operating on 3,000 entities. And then if I select this system, I can actually see the entities. There's a scroll bar here. Uh, and I can select any of these entities, and in the inspector, I will see their properties. Okay, And I can, cannot edit them, because otherwise I will mess up the system. So this is the situation now, like you need to work with the system and we are coming up with new tools because we, we really want to bring back the workflow that you usually do with game objects in this, in this world. Um, so yeah, you can inspect the entities. What, what you cannot do is change these values. You just do that in code, right? So let's, let's take a look at the code just to see how this looks like. So actually I need to... Um, so you see here I have divided actually the code into components and systems. I have an initializer, which is still a uh, mono behavior, which is sitting on this game object here in the scene. And it's just providing some parameters. It's providing how many instances, what's the speed at which they move, and then the mesh that I'm using. So I'm passing the mesh and the material from this mono behavior to the entity component system. So if we look at this, at this script, it looks like this. It's a classic mono behavior with a start function. And in the start function, he's calling this entity manager. Uh, and he's saying word. And word is like a new concept that we have in an entity component system. So get me the active word and get me or create a new manager. And then I ask this entity manager to create this entity that contains these components. So I'm saying just create me one entity with these components, speed, position, heading, transform matrix, and mesh instance renderer. And some of these components are inbuilt, are built in from Unity. So this one, we make it, this one, we make it, this one's, and this one instead is custom. So this one, speed, uh, if I go inside the class, it's like this. So this is the speed of the ship. And as I said before, it's only data. It's not logic. So this particular component is just one float which means that when, you, when you're operating on these 5,000 ships, there's like these little components just laid out in data linearly. 
and then when the system goes in and reads the speed of these ships, it can just go like super fast and you know it has like transform speed, transform speed, transform speed, and it goes like, okay, you are here, you're this fast, I'm gonna move you here. Okay? That's the key of the entity component system. So you can create your own components or you can use like pre-made components like position, heading, transform matrix, you know, all the positions, all, all the components that you might need. So it's creating this entity. It's setting some data. So for example, it's setting a shared data on all of them, the mesh and the material. And then it's creating this new thing which we call native array. So it's asking um, for a new array of entities and it's saying instantiate from the entity that I created. So that entity acts like, a, like an archetype. It's like a, like a model, kind of like a prefab. And then it's saying like instance, uh, instance me 5,000 of them. And then because this is the entity component system, then this instantiate function will take very little time, as I said before. So it's not a game object dot instantiate, but it's entity manager dot instantiate. It's very different. And then I just iterate on those 5,000 and I set the position and the speed. So I put the, sh the ships in like random positions in the world. And I set like a, uh, sorry, just a speed that's um, a little bit random, not that much. So they move at different speed. And then, so this is the creation of these uh, uh, ships. As I said, like the only custom component is the speed one. And then I have the system that operates on the ships. And the system looks, uh, it's like a system that also has a job. So it uses the job system. And as before, it has some common data, delta time and time. And then it executes and it transforms the, the ship's position. So it moves the ships in space. And then here I just schedule the job like before. So it's the, the entity component system is leaning on the job system. And it's using all the threads to move this, these entities uh, in space. Is it clear? More or less? So they work together. And then finally, as I said, the burst, burst compiler, which is also experimental for now, so it's, we're still working on it, is a mathware compiler that uses a new uh, library of mathematics, which is called Unity Mathematics. Actually, the source code of this is also available online, so you can look into it. Um, it gives you this automatic like five times or to 20 times, it depends on the code, of course, uh, speed improvements on the same code. So just by using that library and the burst compiler, then the compiled code will run like way faster. Um, and it leverages what we call the high performance C sharp, which is like a subset of C sharp that we're using in this mathematics library. Um, jobs are built to work with it. So jobs are already using this compiler. And if you stick with this style of writing code, then you're going to get this improvement in speed. So all these systems, they come together to enable this kind of stuff, you know, um, huge words, a lot of entities, um, that as you can see, you know, like the idea is all these entities, like in this case, 25,000 entities or 100,000 entities, um, they do similar behavior, but of course you're still able to control them individually. So you can still have like different graphics, different meshes, different animation. Uh, you can have pathfinding, you know, AI on these entities. The key thing is <coughs> that all these pieces come together to enable this next level of performance. Uh, another thing that you can use the job system for, like now I'm, I'm showing it for uh, many entities, but you can also use it for like complex calculation, like physics. If you're doing like a very complex physics calculation, then you can do it on the job system. And in one frame, you're able to like calculate a lot of collisions and stuff like that. Or you can do like very complex uh, AI calculation, right? So you want to shoot a lot of ray casts and, and you can do that in the job system. Uh, and then, as I said, like the entity component system enables you to do this kind of stuff. And the burst compiler enables, again, like uh, the next level of performance on uh, mathematic code. So they all come together for this kind of stuff. So what's next for uh, Unity? What, what are we doing on this system? As I said, job system is available now. Entity component system and burst, they're available, but they're, they're experimental. So they're not production ready. So what are we doing? We are evolving and refining the job system and the ECS. Um, as I said, the ECS still needs like this uh, to work with uh, 
with the workflow in the engine, we really want to enable that. And that's, you know, that's not a technology problem, that's a UX problem. So there's a UX uh, problem that needs to be solved. And we're still working on it. We're trying to find the most optimal solution. And for that, we, we will like your input. So if you go on the forums in Unity, um, you can download the ECS, the job system. You can try it for yourself and give feedback. And people from Unity are replying. Like Joachim himself is in the, in the threads and he's replying to like every single thread, uh, explaining what we're doing and, and getting feedback. Uh, so yeah, as I said, we want to create ECS workflows for non-programmers. Uh, we want uh, the entities to be in the editor. We want to them to be visible in the hierarchy. Uh, we want to be able. We want you to be able to prefab them. Uh, you know, nesting <laughs> maybe in the future, end of the year, um, and all and so forth. So, what's uh, next for you? You can try it yourself. As I said, if you go to the forums, uh, there's a section called beta and experimental, and then ECS demos, and there's an entire sub forum that has simple demos, so you can download these very simple, simple, simple demos to learn how it works and uh, how to use it. Uh, you can even download the Nordius demo that I showed you, so the big battle that, that I'm using now, uh, you can download it for yourself so you can like look into the code. That's a more complex demo, of course. There's many systems that are working together to, to bring that to life. Uh, but you can download it and see like what they did with that. Uh, there's other repositories, like this is a colleague that uh, she's made a job systems co cookbook. So there's, there's a lot of material online that you can explore and, and learn from. And then the other thing is uh, there's a lot of uh, sessions on YouTube. Um, I would say just take the ones from GDC because you will find some sessions from Unite Austin, from, um, yeah, I think only Unite Austin actually which is when ECS was announced and stuff like that. But if you look at the ones from the GDC, they're you know, more up-to-date and the ECS has evolved anyway. So you will see more up-to-date stuff. So the same Joachim, he's uh, talking about it. He's, he's talking about how Unity will evolve. Not only the stuff that I talked about today, but um, also in other aspects. So it's really, it's really an interesting talk. There's a little bit of repetition with what I said, but there's more stuff. And then Mike Acton, Tim Johansson, and other people are talking about data layout, the job system, uh, how the C-sharp code is, is compiled. So Andreas Fredriksson, he talks about burst. Uh, and then ECS for small things. So how the ECS is powering Unity for small things. And I'm not going to talk about it because I don't have time, but uh, you have to look into it. It's very interesting. When I say small things, I mean small applications. So um, playable ads or you know games uh, in instant messenger and stuff like that. Yeah, so you'll find these talks uh, that were uh, given at GDC. Um, you'll find them on Unity's YouTube channel. They're really easy to find. And if you go to this uh, URL, uh, this will just take you to the forums. So this is an easy to remember URL performance by default with hyphen in the middle. So if you go to here, you will just go to the experimental forum for the ECS, and there you will find all the materials, all the demos, all the documentation and stuff like that. And again, like the developers of that team, which is called the Game Code team, are very active. So if you, if you have doubts, you post there, and they will reply in a matter of days, a couple of days. And this is everything. <laughs>